Hello, world. Guess what? We are back. Back for another MS Conversations Now program, but I'll tell you about that in a little while. In the meantime, we're just enjoying the weather. Oh, my gosh, South Florida today. Crispy, cool this morning. I got up in my PJs to take the doggy outside, and ooh, it was chilly, and it was foggy, and it was just feeling so nice. When I say chilly, I'm talking about South Florida. Yeah, it's our chilly is 60 degrees. Can you imagine that? 60 <laughs> degrees is very chilly in South Florida. 60 degrees for us is probably like 30 for most of you all. Okay. It was just pleasant. It was beautiful. It was today. The sky was crystal clear blue. It was just amazing sky. And the weather, again, it just got nice and coolish today. It was in the low 70s here. And it was just fabulous weather for anybody wanting to go for a walk or or eat healthy. So that's why we're here today. All right. And I'm going to get started with this program right now. Again, this is an MS Conversations Now program, Patients Voices. And I designed this program so that way we can speak with MS patients from around the United States that are doing something in their life benefiting other MS patients, whether it be as a volunteer position or as their career. But either way, you know, we like to um, get involved, um, get people to know what others are doing for them, you know, in, 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 the, in the lifestyle of having multiple sclerosis. So who am I? Yes, I am Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. I also have multiple sclerosis. And uh, tonight we have, well, we have our sponsors. So our program today is sponsored only by MS Views and News. And this, like I said, is a program that I decided to create and for the organization and for the MS community. So tonight's guest, we have Dr. Terry Walls. And Dr. Terry Walls has, you know, she's very interesting. She's um, trying to do something for the MS community that hardly anybody else is doing. And that's trying to find or trying to educate you all on, you know, living better with MS using proper diet, nutrition, and lifestyle, okay? And so tonight's program, so Dr. Walls is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner and a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials. In 2018, she was awarded the Institute for Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award for her contributions in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. She is the author of The Walls Protocol, a radical new way to treat all chronic autoimmune conditions using paleo principles and the cookbook, The Walls Protocol, Cooking for Life. So I want to let you all know that in the handouts, if you click on the handouts, you'll find a few things there, one of which is a study that she recently did. And we're going to be speaking about that when I get to those questions. And um, so I want to get started. So Dr. Walls, how are you? I am fabulous. Uh, it's beautiful weather. Our cool weather uh, is about 30 degrees. And That's so it's a little uh, brisk out walking this morning with my dog. That's great. That's great. So I'm glad that I made the analogy, though, that our 60 is your 30. Yep, it's very accurate. Right. Okay, great. So I want to ask you first, um, you suffered from multiple sclerosis and severe pain due to trigeminal yeah. neuralgia. What can you tell us about your story? Yeah, so uh, my symptoms in neurology began in uh, 1980. Uh, they grew steadily worse. Uh, by 2000, I then developed weakness in my leg uh, and was diagnosed with MS. Three years later, I'm in a tilt recline wheelchair. Uh, I'm seeing the best people taking the newest drugs. Uh, in 2007, I redesigned my diet, my lifestyle focused on my mitochondria. and uh, one year later, I'm able to bike 18.5 miles. It changes the way I think about medicine, the way I think about uh, research, and it's changed the direction of my life. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, tell us about your clinical research and what you have found. So we've done uh, five trials, uh, and we have used the first trial. We just try to see, could other people emulate my diet, uh, uh, meditation, walking, e-stem? And uh, we saw that, yes, they could do that, and it was safe, and that we had a great impact on uh, quality of life. And uh, the next focused on, again, we could show that people could diet, reduce 
uh, improved quality of life. And then we had that larger study that I'm sure that we'll talk about uh, more recently that was funded by the MS Society. Okay, thank you. How is the conflict of interest controlled? Okay, so people know that I've written a couple of books. I've trademarked the terms, the walls, uh, uh, diet, the walls protocol. Um, so every time I do a clinical trial using uh, a modified paleo diet, the diets that, the I, diets developed, that I developed, I uh, go through the conflict of interest in research uh, before the university and agree upon a plan. Uh, and that plan is I do have no contact with the data. Uh, the data is analyzed by a statistician who is blinded to the study assignment uh, so that we can have confidence that there's no bias in the uh, outcome uh, and our findings. Okay, thank you. And how are diet studies different from drug studies? Can you tell us? I mean, well, there's got to be. Yeah. yeah, drug studies are, are uh, randomized, double blind controlled trials. So we put the drug and the placebo in the same kind of container, whether it's an infusion or a capsule or a tablet. So neither the participant nor the researchers know who's taking the placebo and who's taking the drug. In a lifestyle study, you know what you're eating. You know what meditative practice you have. You know what exercise you are doing. Uh, and so you can never have a double blind uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, that means you could have an alternative. Uh, you could have a wait list, uh, but it's never going to meet that same kind of standard. They're also a lot more expensive because it's a lot e harder to get people to change what we eat and what we do. That's a, it, because we have to change people's behavior. Just right. taking a pill only requires a small amount of effort. Learning new recipes, new foods, new exercises, new meditative practices takes effort and time. How do you get people to put more time and effort into what they need to in order to succeed with their new diets? Well, you know, we've been remarkably successful at that. Uh, we use what I call the WALS uh, behavior change model. Uh, it's a 15-step process that begins with uh, an inspirational story of other cases where that people have had success uh, using that item. Uh, and we also ask people to think deeply about their why, what they want their health for, uh, and then we explain the mechanisms of why this intervention may help their disease process. Uh, and then we have, of course, more steps along the way to make it easier to succeed, harder to fail. Um, but going back to the why, which might be that I want to play with my children as they grow up or to walk my son or daughter uh, down the aisle at their wedding or to finish my uh, manuscript or my paintings uh, they've been working on. But we have to have a why that matters deeply. So you're willing to do the work that's going to be required to create these new habits. Sure. Slightly getting off topic, what are you painting? Well, you know, I am an artist. Uh, so my oh. house is filled with paintings uh, that I've done. And my daughter is also an artist. So now we're filling our house with her paintings uh, as well. Do you paint by number or do you do a real brush stroke? Real brush stroke, my friend. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, maybe, you know, we'll all, all these, maybe we'll see them online all these one day. Well, I used to have all these nudes up because um, I, uh, I did that um, a lot of nude paintings. But then when my son and his friends were staring at my paintings, they're like, oh, I got to take those down. We'll just put up the interiors of the landscapes now. So good idea. Good idea. Yeah. But maybe one day we'll see the walls protocol meaning something else. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, Dr. Walls, my next question is, can you briefly explain the study with the Walls Elimination Diet and the Swank Diet and tell us what yeah. these results, what this results slide is about? So, uh, we, we enrolled people, got their baseline uh, measurements of their fatigue, their quality of life, their walking uh, and thinking ability. We observed them for 12 weeks eating their usual diet. Uh, so, we're able to show that their fatigue, quality of life, walking endurance and, and uh, memory were stable. Then we randomized them to either to the low saturated fat swank diet, which we did improve a bit by saying, 
less than 15 grams of saturated fat, uh, four servings of grain, four servings of vegetables, or the modified paleo diet, uh, which is also known as the Walls diet. Uh, and they had uh, five calls with, with uh, registered dietitians. Uh, we brought them all back, repeated all these measures. Then we continued to uh, follow them for another 12 weeks and where they didn't have support, didn't have calls with the dietitians, and brought them back to repeat all the measures to see could they keep things up. We have 77 that came back for uh, the 12 week check and 72 that came back for the uh, 24 week check. Our primary question was, would the WALS diet have a greater reduction in fatigue severity as measured by the fatigue severity scale than the SWANK diet? And actually the SWANK had more fatigue reduction at 12 weeks. The WALS had more fatigue reduction at 24 weeks. Uh, the, the, uh, Assigned, and statistically, they were equivalent. So our, our, uh, what we're able to show is both Walls and Swank had a clinically significant reduction in fatigue because the red lines are um, the measure of clinical significance. The more sensitive measure of fatigue, the modified fatigue impact scale, uh, in that measure, the Walls had a greater reduction than Swank at both 12 and 24 weeks. But again, what I want to point out is both diets improved uh, and reduced fatigue, uh, both at 12 and 24 weeks, with walls being better than swank for some of the measures. The next box over is uh, quality of life. And Stu, you're going to have to help me out. I don't have my glasses on. I think that was the physical health quality of life. Or, yes. uh, men yeah, okay. So at 12 weeks, at, again, the red line is clinical significance. Walls is statistically uh, greater uh, improvement than Swank at 24 weeks. Uh, uh, the Swank has improved uh, physical health quality of life and the Walls has uh, greater improvement. Now in our papers, we don't call this a large clinical, clinical significance because you just don't get to do that in the papers. But clinically, this is certainly a very meaningful change that our patients noticed uh, and had their lives impacted by. And then if you want to flip to the next slide, I can talk you through the uh, next results. So uh, the next thing that we have is the modify, the mental health uh, uh, quality of life. Uh, and at 12 weeks, Swank didn't quite have uh, meet clinical significance. Walls did. Uh, uh, Swank improves at 24 weeks and Walls further improves. Uh, the next box uh, is walking endurance. And we told people this is a dietary study, so don't do any new exercise programs unless your physician directs you to do that. Uh, and so just keep your activity level the same. So we didn't really expect, uh, so it's not surprising at 12 weeks, there's not uh, any change in walking endurance. What I think is interesting and surprising is that the Walls group had clinically meaningful uh, improvement in walking endurance at 24 weeks that was uh, clinically significant. Uh, in terms of the statistical difference between Swank and Walls, that p-value is 0 0.08. So it's, it's a trend. It's not statistically different. But it, I think it's exciting that walking endurance appears to uh, improve. Then again, what's really interesting uh, on the last slide is the symbol digit modalities test, uh, which is a measure of working memory because you have to match figures and numbers. Uh, and it's the number of times you do it, you do it uh, correctly. Uh, and so uh, what we see there is that the Swank diet does better than Walls at uh, 12 weeks, and the uh, Walls diet does better than Swank, or they become equivalent at 24 weeks. And why that is, I um, we don't really know, um, but by 24 weeks, they're equivalent. It may be that it takes a longer time period for dietary uh, changes to improve our working memory. Okay, thank you for that. 
So going forward, you know, we have different patient questions as well as the ones that I have prepared. And um, so I'm, I'm just going to go off track a little bit. What is your recommended treatment for withdrawal and yeast die off? I don't know. I don't know what that is and hoping you do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, many of us who have a diet high in sugar, high in carbohydrates, uh, uh, a lot of liquid sugar will have an overgrowth of yeast. Uh, and when you decrease your uh, carbohydrates in your diet, or uh, uh, you'll have these yeasts die off, and that die off releases some toxins that will cause headache, fatigue, malaise. Uh, you, you may have some GI upset, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. In my clinical practice, I have people take a binder such as activated charcoal, uh, uh, you might take bentonite clay. Uh, there are some other uh, activated, activated uh, binders that a variety of supplement companies have made. And I have people take uh, one to two capsules every four hours with the caveat that binding action is constipating. So you may need to take some milk of magnesia or extra fiber so you don't get plugged up because getting a, a stool impaction is miserable and that will create other serious health problems. Absolutely, absolutely. So what do you what do you tell people that have cravings for sweets? How do you address that? Well, I, I certainly acknowledge that in our experimental uh, models that sugar craving uh, is very, very addictive. Uh, so we talk about addiction, talk about withdrawal, uh, that it takes time uh, and that I, uh, uh, try to get them a peer and a mentor, uh, so, uh, have them eliminate added sugar, use fruit as an alternative, and uh, I often will also include some activated charcoal to deal with the yeast die off as their sugar load decreases. What about just filling up on water? Water is good. Uh, you know, uh, tea, uh, herbal teas are great. So, do you recommend people to use herbal teas for hydration or water? Um, I think yeah, water is ideal. But if you're going to have water, I'd like to see it uh, filtered at least or a reverse osmosis so that your water is purified. Um, I have a lot of concern that people may have uh, contaminated water uh, because mm. they may have uh, lead in their water. They may have um, other pollutants in their water. Uh, there's so much uh, drugs in our urine uh, that is not tested for in the municipal water supply. Um, so my preference is filtered water uh, or reverse osmosis water. You're not saying that we're drinking urine out of the city water supply, are you? Uh, I'm saying that uh, we may, the, the urine's not a problem, but the drugs that are in the urine can't, aren't necessarily being recycled out of the water supply. Hmm, that's strange to hear. So question that uh, I have, going back to something you were saying before, you were saying that the Walls diet and the Paleo diet are the same thing. Can you well, uh, tell? Yeah, they're close, not exactly. Uh, the, uh, the Paleo diet, we try foods that were not available prior to agriculture, uh, so meats, fish, vegetables, nuts, seeds. Uh, the Walls diet provides a, a more precise direction in terms of uh, we want to have uh, green leafy vegetables, uh, sulfur-contained vegetables in the cabbage, onion, mushroom family uh, color. Uh, I stress organ meat. I talk about the benefit of seaweed, uh, the benefit of fermented vegetables. And so it, it's a more precise, this is what to eat to have better nourishment for your brain, a better microbiome, more of the building blocks for remyelination. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we eliminate uh, sugar and processed foods that have a lot of emulsifiers, surfactants, additives that have been associated with metabolic syndrome, uh, dysbiosis, uh, and uh, increased intestinal permeability in the gut. Okay, thank you. Your research is cited. Can you tell us what doctors think? Well, um, you know, many years ago, uh, when I first started talking about diet and lifestyle as being uh, part of essential 
neurological care, that was not generally accepted. Um, however, in the intervening years, we've had multiple studies. More researchers are joining us doing dietary intervention studies. And in fact, many more clinical neurologists are saying, you know what, diet does matter. You have to get off the sugar. You should be following a, a diet, whether it's a Mediterranean diet, a paleo diet, uh, a swank diet, uh, or a nutrient-dense vegetarian diet. Diet quality really matters. And you should be uh, trying to have a stress management program. And I want you to be physically active. So I'd say the best neurologists are now saying much of the same message that I've been saying for the last 10 years, that it's a clinical decision to what to do about DMTs, but everyone will do better if we take care of diet and our health behaviors. Okay, thank They've you They finally that. caught up. Well, speaking about finally caught up and people recognizing more of the work that you're doing, tell us about your involvement now with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and what they're doing with or for you. You know, uh, so it was the National MS Society uh, that it was, it was shortly after my book came out, The Walls Protocol, uh, that they ha held their first wellness conference, bringing together research scientists and patient advocates, and identified dietary research and wellness research as a research priority. The following year, then in, in 2016, they funded our lab to do that study, which we just discussed. That took us four years to conduct that study. Uh, they have created a uh, wellness committee, and within that, there's a subcommittee on diet and nutrition. I am part of that subcommittee, and we uh, have created uh, content uh, related to diet, understanding dietary research on the MS uh, uh, website, uh, and uh, we have created educational programs that have been uh, presented at the uh, consortium of uh, MS centers, uh, which is a clinician's uh, educational uh, service. Great, thank you for that. Can you explain to the audience what the paleo principles are and what functional medication, functional medicine is? Sure, so paleo principles uh, have to do with uh, trying to match our diet and lifestyle uh, elements so they're more closely aligned to how our genes evolved over literally millions of years, uh, about 100,000 generations, so that we have more physical activity, uh, more sleep, uh, time outdoors and sunlight, a better uh, vitamin D level, uh, and that we have a diet that is a closer reflection of the kinds of food that we would have been eating before agriculture. And, and of course, there were many different kinds of dietary patterns because humans migrated out of equatorial Africa uh, all the way up to the Arctic uh, into uh, deserts, swamps, grasslands, and forests. So there are many types of food systems that are, that are paleolithic, uh, but they're based on meats, uh, vegetables, fish, nuts, and seeds. Mm. So in a nutshell, since you brought up the word nut, if that's possible, can you explain how nutrition and lifestyle can impact the disease process and quality of life for a person with multiple sclerosis? Okay. Gosh, you got so, a lot of alarms okay. going off. I thought mine was going Yeah, it's, I thought I had my phone on silent, so apparently not. Okay, could you repeat the no, question again uh, for me? You can have your phone on silent. The alarm still goes off. Yes. Could you repeat the question yes. for me again? Okay. So. Can you explain how nutrition and lifestyle can impact the disease process and quality of life for a person living with multiple sclerosis? Okay, so diet uh, was the strongest impact on our microbiome. <clears throat> and the research continues to grow that the microbiome talks to our um, immune cells and creating a balance, either pro-inflammation <clears throat> or anti-inflammation in healing. And furthermore, the food we eat and the microbiome can make neurotransmitters that get into our bloodstream that will cross over into our brain. And the diet, uh, the sleep, the exercise, all talk to our microglia in our brain. And um, a sedentary diet, a sedentary lifestyle makes my microglia more reactive, more inflammatory. A diet high in sugar 
makes my microglia more inflammatory. Uh, lack of sleep makes my microglia more inflammatory. So if we want to calm our microglia, and there are a lot, there's a lot of research on drugs to try to calm your microglia, but the truth is there's also a lot of research that says diet and lifestyle can calm our microglia. In fact, I'll be giving a lecture about that at uh, the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine uh, uh, in just a couple of weeks. So I, I just recently reviewed all that literature in great detail. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so let me move on here a little bit. And um, have there been any findings that connect dietary changes in fighting fatigue? Um, as a matter of fact, there has been. There's been uh, uh, fatigue and quality of life are the typical measures that people uh, track in dietary studies. So there have been studies uh, for the McDougall diet. Uh, we did studies did for studies the Swank for diet. Swank. Uh, uh, the uh, modified paleo or Walls diet. There's been studies of the Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean. Uh, uh, studies of calorie restriction, restriction. Uh, intermittent fasting. In all of those studies have had a favorable <laughs> impact on quality of life uh, uh, or on fatigue reduction. Uh, and the question is, uh, how long was that study and how large was the impact? There okay, is one you. diet that we know that it makes fatigue worse and quality of life worse. And that diet, Stuart, is the standard American diet. A diet high in sugar and carbs, the diet that is so delicious, so widely available, uh, consistently leads to worse outcomes. So people with that action, you say standard American diet, but can you explain that a little bit further, please? Yeah, so uh, the average, uh, Western person here in the United States, and this is probably uh, true uh, in Europe and uh, the UK, one and a half serenes of vegetables, 70% of the calories are coming from processed foods. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, processed carbs, pastas, breads, pastries, uh, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, 70% of the calories. Uh, okay. So they're eating a lot of sugar, protein, Fat and a lot of that fat is hydrogenated fat. Very few vegetables. This is a diet that is radically different than what we were eating a hundred years ago. Radically right. different than what we were eating 300 years ago, and radically, radically different than what we were eating for the two and a half million years that the genus Homo, our ancestors, uh, evolved uh, when we were in Central uh, Africa. Okay. So those guys that are in those hot dog eating contests, they're definitely eating the wrong food, right? Uh, it's not good. Not good for the microbiome, not good for their brain, not good for the microglia. Okay, great. Thank you for that. There's a David that is asking, can it be too late to change diet in alleviating MS? Uh, absolutely. You can still make... Uh, benefits uh, by changing your diet, uh, uh, reducing your fatigue, improving your quality of life. Uh, in all of our, in our first study, we had people with secondary and primary progressive MS who were between a cane and a walker uh, who were able to make uh, these dietary and lifestyle changes who had remarkable reduction in fatigue and remarkable improvements in their quality of life. Um, so, if you have fatigue or quality of life, I would be very hopeful that you have noticeable improvement within 100 days. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a Patricia asking, does mental use impact fatigue in the same ways that physical use of, that's off my page. Um, uh, I'm trying to get this open. Physical use of oneself. So, um, I'll, 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 hopefully I'm going to answer the question correctly. As we become disabled, it, we, movement is less and less efficient. So it takes more metabolic work for me to walk um, as soon as I have a, a drop foot or if I need a cane or a walker. It's much more exhausting. If I begin to have more lesions in my brain, it takes more metabolic work for me to think. 
for me to speak, for me to have a conversation, for me to make my grocery list. And so that's part of what's driving the fatigue that people with MS experience, because it takes more work to do all the activities of daily life. What is sure. really interesting, as we improve diet quality, that fatigue mar uh, markedly goes down. I, I'm very excited, Stu, that, that we'll be able, in the next study that we're gonna do, uh, we'll have a two-year window and we'll be measuring MRIs and neurofilaments so we can see, hopefully, some of the structural changes that uh, occur as people learn how to feed themselves more appropriately. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so um, I, I'm going to be asking you some questions coming up in a little bit about your studies, about your the studies that are happening and, and uh, about uh, ones that just took place. but. Um, I want to get into more of what the patients are asking right now. There's a Deborah that writes, if you follow the Walls diet, is it likely you will be able to walk without a walker? I'm 100% reliant on a walker. If so, how long sh should that take to occur? Okay, so we have people who have been um, wheelchair dependent, who have done uh, the Walls protocol, but keep in mind, this is much more than a diet. This is diet, um, stress reduction, exercise, physical therapy, the more severe the physical limitations, the more important physical therapy will be because we have to rebuild that connection between your brain and your muscle. Uh, and uh, those individuals will benefit greatly from the addition of electrical stimulation to their physical rehab. And so, yes, we have seen people go from walker to walking to jogging. But it doesn't happen by diet alone. It takes work. And we have people who are willing to spend a couple hours a day doing their exercise and physical therapy to achieve those goals. Okay. Is that, are you telling people that they, it's okay for them to be independent of FDA approved medications? Uh, I am telling them that everyone should be doing diet and lifestyle as part of healthy aging in having the best outcome possible. I want you to work with your neurologist to make clinical decisions about what clinical is right for you what is right. in terms of disease-modifying drug treatment. There is no research that guides us what is the appropriate path to getting people off DMTs, um, how long you have to be stable, what is the criteria. There are some stopping studies that are underway. We are writing some grants to further investigate that question. Uh, that's a clinical decision, but whatever you decide about your DMT, what I am saying is that you will do much better with a great diet, and you, you can decide which dietary pattern you want to follow, a meditative practice, an exercise practice, than if you just eat junk, do nothing, uh, and don't take care of yourself, whether or not you take sure. the DMTs. Okay, thank you for that. All right, next, uh, Lisa is asking, is stevia considered a bad sugar? If so, what can be used in tea and coffee? So um, all of the um, sugars, uh, and there's, there's uh, uh, table sugar, sucrose, in a variety of uh, fructose sugars like coconut sugar, uh, and then there are artificial uh, uh, sweeteners. They stimulate insulin release. Uh, and they put you at risk for insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. Stevia, the leaf, if you get the whole leaf, we don't have enough research to say is that going to be a problem or not. Um, my suggestion in my patients is to wean yourself off that sweet taste. Use fruit, use water, have your uh, tea or coffee black, uh, and get re-familiar Refamiliarize yourself with that bitter flavor. The sweet flavor that we all crave, biologically we crave, we're addicted, uh, puts us at risk for insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, and diabetes. So I prefer that you not use it. Okay, thank you. Are there any foods that are used or nutrition? What's the right nutrition to keep the body from getting uh, spasticity? So spasticity uh, is, develops in response to muscle weakness. Uh, and 
um, uh, and of course the upper motor neuron. My advice is uh, to be sure that you're stretching, uh, having physical therapy, uh, doing things like yoga, uh, Pilates, electrical stimulation of muscles uh, can be very helpful for spasticity. Uh, plenty of magnesium can also be helpful, um, but don't underestimate the importance of um, strength training. Uh, and stretching. So uh, working closely with a physical therapist can be very, very helpful. Great, great. And for anybody that's online tonight that doesn't know, we have Gretchen Hawley on twice a month to do physical therapy classes on our Moving with MS, Moving Mondays with MS. And uh, the other two Mondays of that month, we have yoga and we have Pilates. So it is our Wellness Mondays series that we have. Okay, next that we have... Powerful. That is powerful. It's great. It's great. It's a great. It's a great. Uh, it's a great thing to know that Sunday is the end of the weekend, but Monday is get online with MSUs and and learn how to keep your body going. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next we have next we have a person named Scott asking, is there a an opinion on intermittent intermittent fasting? Yes, it's really good for you. Um, so. If you do the 5-2 plan where you have uh, reduced calories two days a week, that is great for you. If you do every other day, that is even better. If you eat every other day, that is also great. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Time-restricted feeding is helpful. In my practice, I tell people, ease into this at the pace that is comfortable for you. So the first thing to do is to um, have your first meal a little later in the day your last meal a little earlier in the day, okay. and then you can uh, go from there. Okay, thank you for that. All right, what is a fecal transplant? <laughs> well, should I get really graphic? It doesn't even sound like something I want to talk about. No, so, I haven't eaten yet. <laughs> uh, th this is, uh, hopefully you get poop from someone who's healthy. It's <laughs> liquefied, uh, and it's put into your bottom, so that you get poop uh, and the bacteria from someone who is healthy mixed in with the um, bacteria that are living in your bowels. Uh, and for some conditions, uh, it really can be life-saving. So for uh, um, C. difficile, a life-threatening uh, colitis that occurs after antibiotics, that can be absolutely life-saving. There mm -hmm. are studies using uh, fecal transplants in a variety of other uh, conditions. There are case reports of fecal transplants having a um, very helpful impact on some people with neurologic uh, and psychiatric conditions. There are also case reports of people who've gotten fecal transplants for a variety of indications, sometimes C. diff and other neurologic problems, who then developed a new autoimmune or mental health problem because this new mix of bacteria led to uh, other metabolic problems. So it, it's a powerful intervention, um, but we don't know how to, there's not enough information for me to recommend it as a strategy. Okay, thank you for that. Now going on to a person named Patricia, writing, how do you balance a couple of hours a day of meditation, diet, physical activity? Wow, what happened here? Hang on one second. Okay, sorry about that. How do you balance a couple of hours a day of meditation, diet, physical activity? This couple of hours along with my normal daily life seems unsurmountable. So, Patricia, that is a really great question. My suggestion for, for anyone listening is to simply start with a small, actionable step that you can do, uh, that you could be successful at. And it might be while you're in the bathroom, uh, that you take a time to do a four, seven, eight breath cycle, uh, where you inhale to the count of four, hold to the count of seven, exhale slowly to the count uh, of eight, and do a couple of those uh, meditative breathing cycles. And over time, you may be able to tuck in a little more meditative practice, a little more walking into your day. Uh, and it was not until I retired from the VA that I was able to block out for me two hours a day for my self-care routine. Before then, I had to tuck in my self-care into what I did uh, at work 
walking more at work, taking the stairs more at work uh, to get all of that in. We all need to slowly, little step by little step, fit in your meditative practice uh, in your physical activity as it fits into your realistic day. Great, thank you. All right, next question, sorry about that. My computer is going a little bit slow right now because something was running in the background, but I had to just get rid of it. All right, um, it, it thought it was MS and wanted to take over. All right, Renee is asking, is there a substitute for organ meats on the walls protocol? So, uh, yes, uh, a couple of things uh, I want to point out. Uh, heart um, uh, actually is quite delicious. It's like uh, filet mignon. Uh, oysters, clams, uh, caviar, uh, these will all be uh, organ meats. Um, uh, and there are ways to make organ meats that are really quite delicious. Or you could take a organ meat capsule. Um, or uh, there are things I believe, well, let's see. Uh, there are some organ meat blends. I believe uh, Walmart has an ancestral blend that has uh, ground muscle meat, heart, uh, and liver uh, as a uh, sausage that you can uh, fry up uh, uh, that works uh, quite well. Uh, I tell my patients that if you have liver and you pulse it in your um, uh, 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 food processor uh, with about 10% liver, and 90% hamburger, and you make uh, a soup or a stew or taco meat out of that, your family will never know that you just tucked in a little bit of liver. Ugh. I'm a pescatarian. I can't be hearing about that stuff. Have caviar. Uh, well, I could. But you also mentioned something about oysters. Were you talking about Rocky Mountain oysters? Well, I have served Rocky Mountain oysters. Uh, um, but... Uh, oysters, uh, mussels, uh, we do steamed mussels, that's quite delicious. Um, I also love uh, raw oysters. Uh, uh, oyster stew can be quite delicious. So yes, absolutely that can, okay. that can be done. Got it, thank you very much. All right, Deborah is writing, how can one get involved in one of your clinical trials? For example, the upcoming MRI change study, post-diet changes. So if you, um, uh, and I'll make sure that you have this uh, for the show notes, uh, Stuart. Okay. Uh, okay. If you uh, go to uh, the search out Walls Lab, uh, that will, I believe it's walls.lab.uiowa.edu. Uh, um, but I'll, I'll send you the link to be sure that we have it correct. Uh, when our study is announced, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, qual the qualifications will be relapsing, remitting MS, living within 500 miles of Iowa City. Uh, there'll be a few other qualifications as well, but the main one is relapsing, remitting MS, living within 500 miles of Iowa City, being willing to be randomized to any of the three, three diets, and being willing to change your diet. Great, great. I'm more than 500 miles, and I don't eat liver and meat and all that other stuff. Yeah, you're probably not a good candidate, Stuart. No, probably not. Um, all right, Patricia, um, what are you saying here? Hold on, we got this again. All right, Patricia, oh, okay. I'll read this because it's very nice. I really appreciate MS Views and News for all the many outstanding programs they provide. I sign up for many and admit that I don't attend as many as I sign up because I fall asleep. How do we keep her from falling asleep? Well, hmm. I guess we'll have to have some uh, singing and uh, some more uh, uh, audience interactive interactions. Sure, maybe you'll do an online painting class and that will keep people awake, okay? All right, let me get back into some of the other pro the questions that we have that were not directly from patients, All right. such as, um, such as, tell us about the dietary research study 2021. Well, um, is that the study that we just published that you that we went over? Um, we there is another paper that just came out that looked at the diet quality of the two diets because uh, you know both diets are restrictive in that right. the Swank diet uh, restricts that fat, uh, it, so that's a tough diet. Uh, the Walls diet 
Um, you restrict gluten and dairy uh, uh, and eggs. Uh, that's a tough diet. And people are worried that that leads to nutritional insufficiencies. And so we had weighed food records. We analyzed the nutritional intake at baseline and on the Swank diet and on the Walls diet. On both of the diets, the quality of the diet uh, improved. Uh, uh, the vitamin content uh, improved, the essential fatty content, as fatty acids improved. On the Walls group, uh, there was less calcium intake. That's not surprising. Uh, we've made some changes to our dietary recommendations for the next diet to be sure that there'll be uh, more calcium in the diet. Okay. Can you tell us, please, if you had stem cell therapy? I have not had stem cell therapy. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I have many people ask, uh, do I really have MS? How old was my MS diagnosed? I was diagnosed at the Marshfield Clinic. I had a, a spinal tap. I had an MRI. Uh, I was then sent to the uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, uh, who reviewed my MRIs, and my results said, yep, uh, uh, you have MS. Uh, and I started on uh, Copaxone. Uh, uh, I had one more uh, relapse with weakness in my right hand. Uh, um, so that would have been a huge success. One relapse in three years, but the problem was I was in a tilt recline wheelchair. I was steadily getting worse. I went on uh, Novantrone, steadily got worse. Went on Tizabri, steadily got worse. Was then switched to uh, uh, Celsept. Uh, and then I started like, you know, I got to start reading the basic science myself and start experimenting. Uh, and that's when I was like, okay, I have to do everything that I possibly can. Uh, and the one thing that I'd done that was uh, very good was I was absolutely devoted to exercise. I, I uh, exercised every single day, uh, no matter what. I um, originally followed basically the Swank diet uh, at diagnosis, uh, uh, and then switched to the paleo diet when I hit the wheelchair, and then made further modifications to the uh, paleo diet in 2007. Uh, and that's when um, you know really the magic happened. I have a question. I have multiple yeah. sclerosis. People also do not believe that I have multiple sclerosis because of my high energy levels and being able mm -hmm. to run around the country doing educational programs. When I was diagnosed in 98, we learned that I probably had it going back to when I was five, and yet I was diagnosed when I was 39. Okay, um, I had tons of problems as a child growing up, and I had problems even going into my 40s with multiple sclerosis, but then I found a way to beat it so to speak, and that is not using diet, okay? It is using medication that I have used, and it is just being headstrong and not giving mm -hmm. in to the disease. How do you, um, how do you, how would you compare people like me with what others are needing to do with a change in nutrition? You know, how do you, how do no, you compare it? I think we all have uh, some genes that put us at risk, and you might have a different set of genes than I have. We, uh, that's step number one. Step number two is, uh, I think there are 16 different bacteria and viral infections that we have that increase our risk. And for most people, when you, when you get that infection, you clear it, you don't develop autoimmunity, but we do. And then we have all these other environmental factors, diet, stress, sleep, hormone balance, toxin exposures that accelerate the disease or not. And depending on how much disease activity you have, your microbiome, you're going to have to do more work or less work in the sphere of the environment, the things that we control, to improve how happy my microglia are. Certainly, the, the, the dietary program that I use was not going to fix everyone. Um, and nobody can create a diet or a lifestyle program or a medication that will fix everyone. It's easy to, to create a program that will be uniformly fatal. But we are all so biologically unique that the way to get back to optimal health will also be, may need to be uh, personalized uh, so that we have to, we have a starting point that attends to your personal preferences, who you are, and then we 
see how you respond clinically and make incremental changes to try and get you to the state of optimal health. Okay, thank you. By the way, I asked a question about the stem cell therapy before because somebody had written in asking uh, me to ask you about the stem cell, and I that's where yeah, that had you know, come from, I, okay? I, I see so many people uh, asking that, and I think it's hard for them to, to consider the possibility that despite taking vi the very best treatments from the best people in the country, I went downhill relentlessly, and it was through this very intensive lifestyle program that I, that I achieved this remarkable recovery that my neurologist said, you're doing so well, we're gonna take you off DMTs. And I've been off DMTs and continue to do well. A lot of people can't imagine that's possible without stem cells. Right, okay, so another person is asking that, um, I looked into Terry's program several years ago, I came across a podcast. In my excitement, when I was sharing with others, the question was asked, um, and she says this has zero, not meaning any disrespect, but if the program works, why is it not all over the news? The beginning of um, any new innovation is at first treated with tremendous skepticism, uh, and we all do that. Our understanding of the world is how we understand the world, and we ignore new information until there is enough sufficient evidence that will begin to change our understanding of the world. So the early adopters tried it out. And they're like, wow, this is uh, very exciting. We have more adopters trying it out. Uh, we have more clinical research showing that it is beneficial. So yes, we are getting on the news. We are getting on the press. But changing clinical practice takes a lot of research, a lot of time. And we are changing the practice. Many more neurologists are now saying, the quality of your diet does matter, folks. And we want you to be physically active. We want you to have a goal of 300 minutes a week of moderate physical activity, or at least 150. And that we want you to have some sort of stress-reducing practice. When I was diagnosed, even though I seen the best people in the country, nobody was really talking about that. That wasn't stressed. It was always just about the drugs. It's not that the drugs are bad, but finally now more neurologists are saying, you also need to do diet and lifestyle to protect your right. brain. That's correct. Just like uh, when uh, you know Christopher Columbus wanted to sail across the great oceans and nobody wanted to believe him that it was gonna work. You know, and uh, sailors died of scurvy. The first uh, captains that figured out using sauerkraut or lemons saved their crew from scurvy. It still took the navies 200 years to make that a universal practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we know H. pylori is the cause of stomach ulcers. Uh, and when Barry Marshall first proposed that, he couldn't get his um, papers published. He had to uh, publish in a very low impact journal and pay uh, about $3,000 to get it published. And 35 years later, he gets the Nobel yeah, Prize Nobel. in Medicine for that finding. So in my case, to go from you know this odd eccentric here at the University of Iowa, talking about what I was doing, to you know publishing uh, uh, it, it, uh, five studies uh, starting uh, we have our sixth study underway, uh, about to start our seventh study. Uh, in uh, 11 years, uh, being cited and recognized as an important dietary researcher, I, I think that's very rapid progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, Kevin is asking, is Dr. Walls aware of the Pam Bertha's ideas and work? Could, could you repeat that, Stuart? Okay. Kevin is asking, is Dr. Walls aware of Pam Bertha's ideas and work? I apologize. I am not aware. Okay. Kevin, bring it up. <laughs> All right. He's writing something else from Canada. Okay. She doesn't know, Kevin. We'll have to find another person to answer that. Okay. Next, uh, Scott is asking, um, aside from the fact that he's saying thank you for this wonderful service, 
He's asking, I'm sorry, Scott, but it's taking a moment to get to you. Any recommendations for mindset and behavioral strategies to stick to diet? Oh, thank you. That is a wonderful question. So um, mindset, what is your why? What do you want your health for? Um, is it, uh, do you have a wife? Do you have children uh, that you care about? Do you have a dog or a, a pet that you want to go out, uh, take a walk every day? Is So something that speaks to your heart. Uh, uh, then, uh, so that's your why I want to do this. Then you have a small incremental goal. And let's say the goal is I'm going to get rid of uh, sugar sweetened beverages. I'm not going to have any more artificial sugar or uh, sugar sweetened beverages. So I made that decision. I'm going to go to my cupboard, get them out of my house. I will, I'll make sure that they aren't in my work environment. And I will have an alternative beverage, uh, say water. Um, or mineral water, um, or an herbal tea, and I will drink that. So I make it hard to fail by purging my environment. I make it easier to succeed by having ready access to what it is that I want to be consuming. Okay, thank you. I have one last question for you. Then if there are any other questions from the community online, we would love to hear from them. But my question for you is, what is the EDQ research? Well, I'm really excited about this. Uh, this is uh, made possible by Philanthropic Gift. We're going to be looking at the efficacy of diet on quality of life. We'll be comparing the modified paleo diet, a time-restricted olive oil ketogenic diet, and Dietary Guidelines of America diet. People will uh, come in. Uh, we'll get assessments at baseline. Uh, they'll come back at three months. We'll do another round of assessments. Uh, and then they'll come back uh, at, at, at the end of the study at two years uh, and get a final round of assessments. We'll be having uh, um, uh, questionnaires uh, online every three months. We'll be having um, – uh, it, it'll be randomized. So it'll be a randomized uh, between the uh, m modified paleo, time-restricted olive oil ketogenic and dietary guidelines diet. Uh, and because we're going to have an MRI at the beginning and at the end, we'll be able to show uh, what's happening. Uh, we're also looking at sequences. And, and this is a very, very, very exciting, uh, Stuart. We're going to be looking at myelination sequences. Wow. So because the, the DMTs are so effective at keeping uh, lesions down, um, we don't expect there to be much differences between uh, the number of lesions between uh, the three diets. I mean, it'd be great if we would see that, but we, we may not be able to because DMTs are so effective. But the thing that the DMTs cannot do is help people remyelinate. Uh, uh, and we'll be able to look at, can we slow down the uh, brain volume loss uh, uh, by a proper diet? And then this other question that I'm really, really excited about is, can we see improvement in myelination uh, by having a proper diet? And this will be the first study that will answer that question or begin to look at that question. Uh, and then uh, another measure that we'll have that, that's, that we are very, very excited about is we'll have neurofilaments at baseline three months uh, and at 24 months. Uh, and the neurofilaments are a measure of axonal damage and brain cell damage. Uh, and there was just a, a, a paper that just came out that said you could measure differences at three months and at six months based on a dietary intervention uh, that was done in Germany. So we anticipate we'll be able to see differences between these three diets um, uh, over time, and we'll be able to compare that to uh, um, uh, some neurofilament studies that have uh, control data. So. Uh, very excited. And then, of course, we'll freeze blood so I can write for grants so that we could look for uh, metabolic uh, markers as well. So where do you get your frozen blood from? Well, the patients. So, you know, okay. when, we, when, we, when we get, when people come in for the visits, we get the assays uh, for the safety uh, and for the neurofilaments. But we'll also collect uh, two more tubes that we'll process, and I'll put them in little tiny vials, half a mil in each vial, and put them in the freezer. So as science gets better, because science will get better in this intervening five years, at the very end, I'll be able to consider looking at, and it, 
more sophisticated neural panel at the end. Mm -hmm. And we'll be able to consider looking at metabolomics uh, at the end. And we could also consider looking at changes in gene expression at the end. Uh, but you can only do that if you think to save the blood. Very good, yep. So you can get blood in though from patients in outside of the 500 mile range from Iowa uh, or? Nope, I, uh, the, the only blood we're gonna take are from people who are in the study. Okay, gotcha. All right, I have a few more questions. And by the way, I, I was very impressed tonight. I mean, we had a lot of guys online tonight, which I was really surprised about. I think we have more, as many guys as we have women online tonight, which is really oh, impressive. Yeah. And most of the question, and most of the questions tonight are from the guys. Thank you, guys. Wow. I mean, thank you, finally. guys. <laughs> finally. All right. So before I get into the uh, last batch of questions, and now a woman just wrote in something as well. Before I get into the last batch of questions, I just want to let everybody know what's coming up through the middle of December. All right. On this coming Monday, we have yoga. Okay, and that's with Megan Weigel. And Megan is a huge fan of Dr. Walls. And um, and she was really excited when she heard that I was going to have Dr. Walls on tonight. So I'm hoping that uh, once we publish this, that Megan will you know share it with her community as well. All right, but Megan has been doing the yoga series, like I said, with us since last year, and she will be continuing with the Pilates and with the PT people into next year as well. All right, then on December 2nd, I cannot believe we're in December already. It's like where the hell did the year go? Oh, my gosh. All right. December 2nd, we're doing a live program in Cincinnati, Ohio. And now, as of today, we are also live streaming that program. So we will be in Cincinnati. We do have people coming to the program and we'll be live streaming. And this is with Dr. Aaron Boster. It's on the genetics of multiple sclerosis. It's going to be a fabulous talk. Also at that program, we're going to have yoga therapists from, from, um, Detroit, and that is Mindy Eisenberg. She's an MS guru as well, and she'll be at the location and she'll be, you know, working out with the people that are there as well as those online. On December 4th, so, sorry, Dr. Walls, but I just have to do all these, all right? On December 4th, we're going to be in Louisville. We're going to be in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm there to have some bourbon, all right? I can't wait to get back to Louisville, drink some bourbon, maybe get out to the track and look at some of the horses. All right. And yes, we're there to do our program as well. And also, Dr. Boster will be speaking at that program on a different set of topics that also includes symptom management. Symptom management. Sorry. On um, on December 8th, get three more programs to talk about. All right. December 8th is our MS Neuro TV program with Megan Weigel. And she's going to be speaking about holistic health during the holiday season. OK. And then on the very next night, we're going to be with the people. For, well, we're going to be with the um, the lead um, the lead medical advisory person for the National MS Society, and that's Timothy Coetzee, and uh, he's head of their patient advocacy as well. And we're going to be speaking about what's been going on with the MS community since COVID and where we are now, almost two years later. It's incredible where we're at with this already, okay? Um, and then on the 11th of December, we'll be doing another live program in Lakeland, Florida. So if anybody lives within driving distance to Cincinnati, Louisville, or Lakeland, we hope that you come to the programs, okay? You could go online to the website and check all these out, whether live, virtual, or otherwise. You can just go to the website and get signed up for our different programs. All right, now let's get back to the questions for you. And sorry about that commercial endorsement that I have to do, but heck, no, oh, that's very important. You're doing wonderful work, Stuart. It's MS Views and News. I mean, this is what we're here for, to provide you with the news. And for anybody that doesn't know, when I started this all out, it was Stu's Views and MS News. But that was just thrown up to me again today by other people, and they wanted to know why we didn't keep it that way. Well, we had to go corporate. Couldn't stay with my name. All right. Scott is asking, uh, not Dr. Wall, just been following her work hard to implement her diet. Um, Okay, so anyway, oh, because I asked him if he uh, knew you on like a work level as well. All right, so sorry about that, Scott. Sorry for announcing it to all. All right, Kevin was telling us who Pam Bertha is, the founder of Live Disease Free International Wellness Publishing, Inc. out of Canada. So I guess he wanted you to know that as well. And then we have Deborah. Deborah is saying, I participate five days a week in exercise classes, about an hour a day. I have improved my diet by eating Mediterranean. I have a very low stress life. I've been diagnosed with PPMS, 
but have had stable MRIs for the past six years. Do you believe the stability of my MRIs and mild improvement in symptoms are related to my lifestyle as I'm on no disease modifying drugs? Absolutely, keep it up. You know, we, we have um, uh, published data from our first study. We included folks with primary progressive MS. As a matter of fact, I uh, ran into uh, the lady with primary progressive MS uh, when I was talking in her community, she came up, gave me a big hug, and says, you know, I'm still doing everything, and I can tell if I stop, uh, my fatigue is worse and my walking is worse. So keep up the good work uh, and be very optimistic that you can hold your own. Okay, now I'm going to have to be the, the counter person to all that. I'm going to have to tell people that they must... Um, they must speak with their doctors about anything if they're changing or getting off their already use of medications, right? I yes, am a yes. I am a patient advocate for MS medications, so I cannot say anything other than to remain on your MS medications because what might be good for one person may not be good for everybody. So I implore that you do stay on your MS medications and speak with your doctor about this. And, and I do want to clarify that what I was saying was to give credit for diet and lifestyle. I was not endorsing going off drugs. That's a con Whatever you're doing with your drugs is a conversation with your neurologist. My right. comments are always about be sure that you are taking care of your diet, taking care of stress, taking care of exercise. And for some, we have uh, in my clinical practice, and they've been able to transition with their neurologist approval off their DMTs. There is no clinical research that uh, gives people clear guidance. You always work very closely with your medical team, your primary care team, and your neurologist for all of your medication decisions. Okay, great. The last question is from a guy named David. He wants to know about honey. How is that good for you? Other than it's nice and sweet, right? It's nice and sweet. Uh, there is a uh, uh, hunter-gatherer society, the uh, Hadza, that did use honey as part of their uh, dietary intake. Uh, my suggestion is if you want to have a teaspoon of honey a day as part of your overall uh, sugar allotment, I think that is healthy and is uh, fine for you. Um, but uh, if you're using lots of honey as a replacement so that you're having 20 teaspoons a day, that will not be good for you. Okay, thank you. And I'll just say that to David, that's a buzz buzzword, right? Okay, so that's it. We've finished with all the questions, whether our team put together or the patients, you know, their questions as well. Dr. Walls, I want to thank you very much for being online with us. We will have this published and on to our YouTube channel in less than a week. And um, again, thank you everybody for being here and um, come and join us, you know, come and join all of our programs. Thank you very much. And Bill, we are out of here. Thank you.